My name is Laurel Snyder, and my favorite thing is the marriage of Jason Isbell and Amanda Shires. Welcome to the Finding Favorites podcast, where we explore your favorite things without using an algorithm. Here's your host, Leah Jones. Hello, and welcome to Finding Favorites. I'm your host, Leah Jones, and this is the podcast where we learn about people's favorite things and get recommendations without using an algorithm. I am so excited. Today, I am joined by an author that I've known, I feel like since the beginning of blogging, or not since the beginning of blogging, because I wasn't Jewish then. So I wouldn't have met her until after I converted, probably. And that is author Laurel Snyder. She is a prolific author. Her newest book is called The Witch of Woodland. But you may know her from books like Endlessly Ever After, Charlie and Mouse Lost and Found, Charlie and Mouse Outdoors, My Jasper June. There was one at the very beginning of when I met you about a pig who wanted to be kosher. Correct. (laughs) Was it Baxter? Baxter, the pig who wanted to be kosher. So you are you're a prolific writer. And I'm so excited to be with you today. Laurel, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm I'm really good today. I I have a hard time with boundaries in my life. I think a lot of us do these days. Mm -hmm. Our work and home lives have bled into each other so much. And yesterday I decided I was going to actually have a day, like a weekend day, Shabbat, whatever you want to call it. And I like, you know, took a long walk, ate a delicious meal, rested, watched movies. And I like woke up this morning. And I was like, oh, that's why we have weekends. <laughs> it mm-hmm. feels so good. So I'm in like the best mood possible today. Great. Uh, yeah, I think it's hard in the in the years when I've been a freelancer, it can be really hard to take a day for yourself because... There's always work to be done. There's always chores to be done. If you're not doing your your bankable work, there's the house chores. And it just is endless. And it is so hard to unplug or take time off. So that's I'm glad you were able to do that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm working. It's like one of my projects right now is to set those. My husband works from home half time, but he has a computer and a phone that are his work phone and computer. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Friday at five, he closes the computer and he sets the phone on top of it and they're they're away until Monday morning. And I, I like in my head, I'm thinking about maybe moving that direction of like, could I like, it, it's hard to imagine, but like, could I do that? Could I have a Jeff, like a whole different setup for work? And that I like lock away? Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I because I work, I have a corporate nine to five, I have a work computer. It is right there. <laughs> it's only Staring five inches you. away <laughs> um <laughs> but this year and then I have a, a a macbook that I do my podcasting on and um but this year in the last year I got my very first ipad mm-hmm. and I went on vacation in September and only took the ipad and I'm like I haven't traveled without a laptop yep in probably 20 years yep and I'm not going to I'm just going to take oh, my email is only on my phone. I didn't put email on the iPad. I'm just going to do TikTok and listen to podcasts and, yep. um, you know, take pictures with an iPad like a wild person. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's helpful. I wish I could get to have it. I wish I could have two separate phone devices. Yeah. Um, the phone is the hardest. We, yeah. I, I was actually just saying to my family, I was sort of feeling it out. I was like, what if for Mother's Day this year, what I want is for us to rent a cabin for a night and actually lock all the phones in the glove box mm-hmm. for 24 hours? Like, could we do it? Could all, right. like, cause I have teenage kids, like, could all four of us set them, set them aside for 24 hours and just like take a walk, read a book, go for a kayak or something? Um, so we'll see. And did everyone run screaming from the room Nobody, initially, or no, they no, everybody considered was, I think it? The, I think that Mother's Day, <laughs> Mother's Day is like the hardest holiday in the world. Mm-hmm. I think they were all sort of like like deer in headlights, like don't say no, don't say no. Uh-huh. It's Mother's Day; she'll get upset. <laughs> yeah, but nobody nobody objected yet, so we'll see. All right. Well, I hope I hope that happens for yeah. you. I'll let you know. I'll check back. Yeah, you'll be like, look, I even said it on a podcast. Yeah. Did you yeah, hear the podcast where I now. asked <laughs> you to go to a cabin with me? Yeah, right. Like a promposal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On a podcast. So, Laurel, your new 
book, mm-hmm. The Witch of Woodland. Mm-hmm. Um, is it when is does it come out? It comes out May sixteenth. Awesome. Um, and I should say I write mostly for children. I started out writing for adults, um, and then at some point realized that what I was really doing was pretending to write for adults when what I wanted to tell were children's stories. Um, so it's a middle grade novel, uh, and it's it's. It's been a laborious, more laborious than anything else I've ever done in my life. I started it before the pandemic. It was supposed to be due in 2020, like finished in 2020 mm. to come out the following year. And um, and my son was having a bar mitzvah. And so it's a, I'm Jewish. It's a, yep. but as you know, um, it's a book about a kid who's prepping for their bat mitzvah. And I thought, well, this is great. Like, I'll just pull all this stuff out of what's happening in our lives as Lewis is having his bar mitzvah and put that in the book. And then of course, in March of 2020, Lewis's bar mitzvah was canceled. Mm -hmm. And I sort of had to force like imagine fake as like the bar mitzvah became this incredible stressor in our lives and this very sad loss. I was found, found myself trying to write about that very process and it was just a disaster. And also like I was distance learning with my kids at home and it was just a disaster. Yeah. And so the book took an extra couple of years and finally, finally, finally we finished it. So it's a couple of years behind schedule. And as sometimes happens when you don't do a good job with something at first, it became a kind of albatross. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I struggled and struggled and then ultimately had to, I really did rewrite it soup to nuts four times. Like I just kept wow. being like, that wasn't it. I'm going to start over. That wasn't it. Because I felt like I needed a whole different self. Mm-hmm. Like I had to get out of my pandemic trauma brain to yeah. write a fresh copy. And so we finally, we finally arrived at the book that we should have had in 2020. Um, so it's exciting and wonderful to have it coming out. And also like I've been living with it for five years mm-hmm. and it's hard to let it go, yeah. but it is about a girl named Zippy who is growing up in my neighborhood here in Atlanta in a very sort of non-Jewish, non-traditional progressive. It's if you've been watching Atlanta on the news for the last five years, mm-hmm. it's, it's that Atlanta. Yeah. Um, and uh, and she's not growing up in the Jewish community and her parents are not particularly observant and she doesn't know that she believes Jewishly. And her mom comes home one day and says, you need to start prepping for your bat mitzvah. And she's like, why? <laughs> we don't go to synagogue. Right. I'm not sure I believe in God. Um, but the but that's, extra- and that's though a pretty normal experience for someone growing up secular Jewish or maybe in an interfaith household that yep. there are a few things that your your Jewish parent thinks are important, but they don't lay the groundwork ahead. Like they don't lay the path your whole life to know it's important. Mm-hmm. It just kind of it, like sideswipes people. Yeah. And I that's sort of where it started as I asked my son early on in his process, because we, you know, and he had gone through Hebrew school all along. Right. Go to a super progressive. You know, I think you know Rabbi Josh Lesser, don't you? Like, I don't. I f- but I oh, feel oh. like I. I feel like I know people, other people at your synagogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's just a really we're in a really radically inclusive community, and um, and it's not been a negative experience. But at some point, I asked Lewis. I said, "Do you believe in God?" And he said, "Does anybody really believe mm-hmm. in God?" Like that. He had a very. Uh, honest response to it that made me think like there are conversations we are not having with our kids in a lot of cases that's a sort of almost a consent conversation but at the very least a communication conversation about like what does this mean for you and what can it mean for you that's meaningful Um, and so that was sort of the beginning of it but the, the other piece of the puzzle is that Zippy um, and she is from an intermarried family although it's um, both of her parents were raised Jewish her father's father is not Jewish. So she has okay. a non-Jewish last name, sort of is growing out, up outside the normative Jewish community, mm-hmm. but, um, but does have two Jewish parents. And, uh, and, but she's a witch. She thinks she's a witch. She believes she's mm-hmm. a witch. She's been casting spells her whole life. So she ha- does have a belief system. She has something she believes very firmly in. Um, it just isn't Judaism. Mm-hmm. And it's about sort of, I mean, we're all a kind of Venn diagram of belief, right? right. Like, and so this is, what I really want to do with the book is I really want to go out into the community and meet with kids. Like in my dream world, I'd have like a book club for kids who maybe don't feel fully included or sure about the path and mm-hmm. want to talk about like how it could be a meaningful experience for them Jewishly, um, what makes them who they are or what they believe in, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. So that's the book. That's wonderful. Um, so it's out in May, right? Mm-hmm. May 16th? Yes. May 16th outstanding um yeah i think it's gonna be 
I think it's important. I think it's an important story to tell. Um, also, because I see with our bar and bat mitzvah students at our at my synagogue, and I just looked up Rabbi Josh. I've got thirty people in common with him. So. Yeah, no, I, I feel like you guys have circled <laughs> each other in some way. At some yeah. Um, that that like modern Jewish life means growing up also with access to other belief systems and more more information and more ways of of building an ethical uh, ethical um, scaffolding for yourself yes um so i think it's yeah it's such a valuable piece of that puzzle but but there's this sort of illusion there's this game we're playing that everybody does have the same set of experiences Mm -hmm. and then i feel like it forces us to fake some experience so like for instance for me i grew up in an intermarried home Bat mitzvah in the reform community. But then I like got a Jewish studies degree and went to work for I think you and I have mm-hmm. had similar journeys of like there's things you can learn from right. books and from other people and from school and but there are things you can never learn because right. you didn't have a grandmother who did this or cooked that yep. or whatever. Or you didn't know what sweater was the cool sweater and when you were twelve years old and all the mm-hmm. other kids at Hebrew school did or whatever. There's all this stuff you can't gather together. Um yeah, I I I feel like that calling that out and saying like there is no normative Jewish experience every family is an intermarried family every mm-hmm. family has conflicts and and questions and and like additional layers of great value um, yeah. and that the pretense that we all live on the same cul-de-sac or something you know is is it's it can make things really hard so. yeah I remember reading an article man 10 or 12 years ago that was about it was it was taking couples, Jewish couples, where both people were Jewish or identified, you know, right. but it was about intramarriage uh-huh. and about how difficult if you come from different, you know, if one person's modern Orthodox and one person is reform, but you can you can live Jewishly in very similar ways. Yes. Um, but there's still like, how do you navigate coming from different Jewish backgrounds. Well, and in some cases, am I very, this, I don't remember, I don't, it's hard for me to remember, like, with the early blog days people, mm-hmm. like, when exactly we came into each other's lives. So I don't remember when exactly I met you, but my first book was actually a book for adults called Half-Life. That was a collection mm. of essays about growing up intermarried. And so I yeah. edited this collection where I was working with a lot of other people, a lot of other writers. It was specifically people who identify as writers, like people who are novelists, poets, whatever. Right. The premise of the book was like, there's something about the experience of an intermarried sort of hybrid identity that pushes us to want to explore it in writing, pushes us mm-hmm. to want to think about our identities in this more interrogated way or something. Yeah. Um, and uh, that that it's in some ways, I think, harder the closer those identities are. So mm-hmm. like my husband and I, he was raised Catholic. I was raised Jewish, um, but an intermarried home. Um, so the, those two things were not going. But he's not a believer. Like he d- didn't want to participate in his community in that way. Um, and so it was sort of we divide and conquer. Like mm-hmm. this is my area. That's your area. Yeah. So Judaism and religion and Jewish education were my department with the kids, things like that. Whereas I think sometimes when those things are too close to each other, then it becomes tricky of like, well, this is the way we do it. No, no, this is Mm -hmm. the way we do it. It's the same thing. You're not arguing about like what to do. You're arguing about like how much salt to put in the pot, you know? I remember when a a girlfriend of mine who was from L.A. married a man who had been raised kind of modern Orthodox or conservadox in Chicago, but his mom was British. Um, They got married pregnant with her first child and that's when she found out that she had married into a family that didn't do baby showers because of superstition of course and she was like you're gonna tell all these jewish women from la and beverly hills they can't give me (laughs) a baby shower Mm -hmm. she was like are you kidding you're gonna tell all the women in my life they can't and i think that was one of the moments when she was like oh this the our jewish is so different from each other. Well, and that's a tricky one because from a, like, religious, Mm -hmm. like, traditional point of view, a baby shower is frivolous and superficial. Right. But to somebody who's grown up with that as custom for them, as Mm -hmm. somebody for whom, like, the family cares about that, it's not frivolous or superficial. That's a meaningful moment Mm -hmm. that you want to share intergenerationally. It's about generosity. It's about Mm -hmm. excitement and getting ready. 
Um, so yeah. yeah, I think that there are a lot of things like that. Like, yeah, the, the things in my, in our household that matter, like if, if like my father, if you were to suggest using a food processor to make latkes, would like lose his mind. <laughs> like that's not halacha. Like, right. But, but that's, it's like a thing. It's a tradition. How many years of our lives have we all put knuckle skin in the potatoes? Right. This right. is part of the, this is the, the experience of Hanukkah. Um, yeah. And you can't take that. Like if, if, if we were to have married into a food processor family. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's exactly what I mean when I say every family is an intermarriage. Like, there's mm-hmm. just no norm, really, in the world today. Yeah. Outstanding. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to it. You're available sure. for school visits. You're going to New York in early May. Yeah, I'm going to be sure. in New York yeah. and Virginia and, uh, like, upstate New York. I forget where else I'm going now. Shenandoah of- Children's Literature Conference. Yeah, there's a Shenandoah Children's Literature Conference at Allegheny. Um and uh, yeah, I'm still figuring it out. I, I do think, I mean, my big plug here and what I'm going to be trying to talk about is I really want to do a book club using virtual tools. Mm-hmm. I feel like I grew up as the only Jewish kid in the class or one of two or three. Mm-hmm. And my kids have had that experience. And Zippy in the book is having that experience. Yeah. And I found myself thinking like the whole point of the book was to write a book for Jewish kids who maybe feel like outsiders. Mm-hmm. And a lot of us are that kid. Um, but those are the exact people that it's hard to, like I used to work for Hillel and I worked for Interface Family, which is now 18 mm-hmm. Doors. Uh, that kind of outreach work of finding the people who don't feel connected already is just right. the hardest work to do in communal work. Mm-hmm. And um, and so one of the thoughts is something like, I, this is a very rudimentary idea at this point, I haven't worked it out, but we'll have study guides and we'll have study guides for Jewish schools as well. But what I really want to do is some sort of a book club where I like pull together either small groups within a community and go and do an in-person book club, but like sort of using web tools to pull everybody together or um, or some sort of an online book club where we do mm-hmm. like a monthly meeting and we read a couple chapters and talk about it. And the groups are the kids are grouped in small group pairings yeah. or for outbreak, you know, or breakout sessions and. But specifically for kids where the idea would be to like nominate a kid for the, the you know, only in my class book club or something right. like that. Um, yeah. Just to the, there are. Yeah. 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 And I, and I hear you that it's hard to then, how do you, how do you find the kids that are maybe the only kid at their bar at their synagogue? That's an hour away having a bat mitzvah this year. Exactly. Right. Like, well, and without pointing at them and going, Hey, you, you look lonely. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Because that would be terrible too. Of mm-hmm. like, how do you how do you make it available? I yeah, I just had some interesting phone calls with some people from some different organizations that might be useful umbrella groups. But um, but yeah, that's what I want this book to do. It's just to like Zippy can be a friend, as books were friends for me. Mm-hmm. Zippy can be a friend for a kid who maybe is the only Jewish kid in their class, or isn't having a bat mitzvah but would really like one, mm-hmm. you know, or is having a bat mitzvah but doesn't really want to. Um, that, that there's just a lot of dissonance at that age. Adolescence yeah. is hard. And, and I think books, Jewish books for this age tend to fall into the like nostalgia old world books, mm-hmm. the Holocaust books, and then the like wealthy middle class normative Judaism, mm-hmm. you know, cul-de-sac books. Yeah. And so the goal was just to write something that wasn't one of those basically. You know, we started this talking about your son's, um, scuttled bar mitzvah at the beginning of mm-hmm. the pandemic and we are now I, you know i think we had two years where our our bar and bat mitzvahs our b'nai mitzvah were virtual yep and it was um now we're starting to have their little their younger siblings are having mm-hmm. their synagogue bar and bat mitzvahs and it's really it's really interesting in some families we saw that like Somehow the universe gave each kid the 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 moment they needed, where sometimes yeah. the older sibling, the virtual the virtual bar bat mitzvah was like the thing that was most appropriate, and the younger kid is getting their you know big party everybody in the synagogue thing and that fits their personality better, um, and it's just been really interesting 
to see I, also. I like, also think there's a yeah. weird instinct from the family perspective, not the kid, not centering the kid, mm-hmm. but centering the family and saying like, well, this kid had to have the Zoom, so we're going to really blow it out for this mm-hmm. kid. And it's like, well, that doesn't seem fair. <laughs> right. Um, we did end up having one, and it was the very first in-person. We had vaccination proof, everybody masked, windows mm-hmm. open, but inside distanced. Yep. And we still had a COVID case in the room. It was a very yeah. small child and nobody got sick because we because we were so careful, because everyone was masked yeah. because it actually ended up being okay. But having to send out that email the next day that was like, mm. hey, everyone, sorry to tell you this, yeah. but despite all our precautions. But we ended up having the party. We did move the party at the very, very last minute. I like lost, we were going to have it at a restaurant and we still weren't eating out at that point, but we didn't know what else to do. Yeah. And at the last minute, I couldn't do it. I felt like I can't safely invite grandparents into a closed space right mm-hmm. now. And so we, in the last week, we moved the whole thing to my yard um, and rented a tent and rented chairs and tables. Yeah. And, you know, found a neighbor who was willing to cater the thing and some other Amazing. neighbor baked the cake. And so it had this very stone soup feeling to it. Yeah. Of like everybody, you know, one friend brought, like, one friend brought mason jars with candles in them and one friend bought flowers and um it was it really was a collective effort and and there was this just beautiful moment at the end of it where um we'd had dinner you know we'd had the service we'd come to my house we'd had dinner everybody'd hung out and my friend jenny brought out this amazing amazing cake that she had made um that looked like the tabernacle (laughs) Mm. and or a rendering of the tabernacle And I realized that everyone present, hundred like 150 people, because since it was outside, we like added. I was like, well, sure, everybody come. right. Um, and uh, that it was the first birthday party in over a year. Mm-hmm. And so then I was like, wait, it's everybody's birthday party. Like nobody yeah. had a birthday party in a year. And so we sang. It was like it wasn't even Lewis's birthday because of course the whole thing had been postponed a year and a half. Right. But um, but we sang Happy Birthday as we cut the cake to everybody. Mm. Um, so that it could be like a big collective birthday party. It was pretty special. So it was exactly what it needed to be in the end, but it mm-hmm. was a lot of heartache to get there. Yeah. The Witch of Woodland, like I've said, available in May. Pre-order now. Pre-order through your your favorite local bookstore, through bookshop.org. We will have links to it in the show notes. Um, yeah, and if anybody wants a signed copy, you can order through uh, Little Shop of Stories here in Atlanta, in Decatur, Georgia, and I'm happy to go sign copies and personalize them and they'll send them out for you. Outstanding. You know, books are often the reason why people come on my podcast when they do. Um, but we're also here to talk about one of your favorite things, which you said is your is Jason Isbell and Amanda Shires, your favorite musical couple. That's correct. Yeah, it um, I mean, like this is one of those things where I often like I stalk them online and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I often feel like it gets to be creepy a little bit. <laughs> like, like, do I love them too much? Is it a mm-hmm. little too weird how how important they've become to me? Um, I don't think so. Like, I don't think I'm you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't think I'm stalking them. I sometimes have to pull myself. I adore Jason Manzukas, And there are times when I'm like, nope, nope, Leah, you, you've now, you've gone too far. <laughs> pull yourself back. Well, <laughs> Take it's a, a weird, step back. <laughs> it's a weird thing that we have access to our like celebrities, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and if your celebrities are not like Taylor Swift is never going to write me back, but Jason right. Isbell does write me back. And so it's this yeah. weird thing of like, it's if you're, if you're a super fan for somebody who's kind of an indie person or that you've been going to see for decades or whatever, it is that sort of slightly weird thing. Um, but I, my first, so initially I did not love them. Like I did not, like it was, I first encountered Jason Isbell. He was in the drive by truckers, oh, which yeah. was a band that I listened to a lot in college and grad school. Yeah. And um, I had gone to college in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which isn't too far from Athens, where the truckers were based. And then I went to the University of Iowa for grad school, and they would come through a lot. They would come through and play Gabe's or the Green Room. And so, and my husband's a musician. He was my boyfriend then. And so we would, we just went to see, like, our relationship has always been rooted in live music. Mm Mm-hmm. And so we would go to all these shows. And so I remember the first time I saw Jason Isbell, he was he held a door for somebody at the green room as I was like going in. 
And I just remember being struck by how incredibly tall he was. He's, he sort of <laughs> seemed taller than I thought he would be. And he was a mess. He was a disaster. He was okay. drunk and he was like, it was just, he was sort of straggly haired. And it, it, my initial like sort of take was like, yee, like I don't want to hang out with that guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, like we loved their music. We went to see them play a bunch of times. They, they were out on tour with this other band, Slobberbone. And, um, and then years went by and I heard sort of murmurings that, that he had this new band and he was doing solo work and that it was really exceptional. And I didn't, I just didn't check in with it. I don't know why, but like I mm-hmm. never, that was pre like digital music days where like you would have had to make an effort. You would have had to go and get a CD or whatever. Right. And I didn't. And then my husband started listening to him. I think, um, which record would it have been? something more than free, probably, um, started listening to him and wanted to go see him live. And so he was, like, listening to him around the house, and I wasn't paying a ton of attention. And uh, we went to see him live at the Fox Theater here in Atlanta, and I was just utterly blown away. It was, the, And I'm a huge Springsteen fan. Mm-hmm. It was the first time, I think, really, I'd had a concert experience like a Springsteen show where I was, like, I, like every song was sort of stuck in my head, even though I'd never really heard them before, and I went home kind of humming lyrics. Wow. And yeah, it was like it, it like embedded the way yeah. that things sometimes can, but don't usually. And so I went home and, and started listening to it in kind of constant cycle. Um, and so like, you know, we were fans. And um, and then I had this weird summer where my partner and I, my husband and I were fighting. We were having a hard time. And I, I teach in Minnesota for a couple of weeks every summer. And I went to, this is going to sound so creepy. <laughs> I went... <laughs> I went to Hamlin, to Minnesota, where I teach, and I, where I have a room to myself, which isn't normal for me. And, um, and every night going to sleep, I listened to this record, The Nashville Sound, that he had put out. Because Chris and my husband and I were not in a good place, and I felt mm-hmm. like there was something about, like, I associated Jason with Chris, and therefore listening to this music that I loved made me feel less angry. Mm-hmm. at Chris like there was something about like a therapeutic process of like going to sleep every night listening to these songs um, that really kind of shifted my brain and I came home in a very different place but it really was with like these song lyrics in my mm-hmm. head and um, and so by that point it felt like intimate to me it felt like this is a person whose music I now know deeply in the way that you know the songs you grow up listening to at bedtime mm-hmm. or you know the songs you fall in love to or something it was just a very different kind of relationship that I had with those songs. It wasn't, it was a reconciliation and a like strenuous sort of processing, not, not dancing or, you know, mm-hmm. falling in love. And then the pandemic hit. And, um, and so but by that point, like our household was an Isbel household. Like we had started listening to his music around the house as a family. My kids know his music. They mm-hmm. have his t-shirts, you know, like it had become, I'm actually wearing one of Amanda's t-shirts right now. Nice. But, um, But then the pandemic hit and this funny thing happened where we kept having these opportunities to engage with Jason and then also Amanda. So Amanda is his wife and she has her own amazing musical history. She's Mm -hmm. a film player. But the last show that my older son and I went to see just coincidentally right before lockdown was she came to play the Variety Playhouse in Atlanta and Mose and I went to see her. Mm. So I have these pictures of the last big concert we went to and then the world closed. Right. And there was something about that. Like we sort of came home with these posters and these t-shirts and then the world went away. And then she and Jason started doing this thing called ISO lounging on, it was really her thing on her YouTube feed where every Friday evening we would like light the Shabbat candles Mm -hmm. and, and listen to Jason and Amanda play music together in their living room, basically. Mm. And it was a safe thing we could do. It was something that changed the week. Um, it wasn't, you know, religious, but it, it began to feel like ritual. It was right. like, we light the Shabbat candles, we make a nice dinner, we have a glass of wine, we listen to ISO lounging, and we sort of banter mm-hmm. as though they are in our living room with us. Right. And it really was just this incredibly innovative, magical thing that they did for anybody who wanted it. Um, that, and that, that, one that, of the wonderful things about having two musicians in a house together is there's not the Zoom delay, there's not the there's not the trying to make music together and it doesn't work and it's not really live. It's they're actually together in the house making music. Yes. 
And you mix, can feel yeah. that, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're getting to be invited into that. So they were sort of sharing their musical family with the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then, and I don't want to over talk it, but like, and then, and then just one by one opportunities arose. Like they, Jason came through with his band and played a, a, ch- a show that was like in a parking lot where you got a car space and then a car space next to your car where you could set up chairs. Mm. And so it was totally distanced. Like they had like a, like a, um, like a golf cart that they would like throw t-shirts out of. If you put on, if you wanted a t-shirt, you put in your order online and they would toss it to you. <laughs> so you literally never came within 10 feet of anybody. Right. But you managed to go to a live show. Um, and so it was like each stage of the pandemic, there was another level where he made space safely for the rest mm-hmm. of us. Like there were these virtual shows that we paid to see. And then there were these car shows. And then he played an outdoor brewery in Athens um, that again was distanced and safe and right. masked and and then finally, 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 when everybody was vaccinated, we went and to Nashville and saw them um, at the Grand Ole Opry. Mm. But again, vaccinated show. We wore masks. Like yeah. he just made space. He made a safe space to keep seeing music. Yeah, in a way that um, a lot nobody of musicians else didn't. Did. Yeah. yeah, and and I I don't know. So I love them in in like all these different ways. I feel like they are incredibly generous online. If you follow them on Twitter or Instagram, like the way that they interact with each other, the way that they have opened up and shared their own challenges. They do. They, um, they've gone a couple of times on Seth, De- uh, death, sex and money. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know that podcast, but, um, and they're just, they're really open about it. he's, uh, in recovery and talks a lot about sobriety, uh, which is also a really mm-hmm. interesting, uh, subject. I don't know. It's, it's, but it, it is, it has been this weird thing where, like, I, I do tend to be a fan. Like, I, I fall deep into things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I keep waiting to come out of this one. Like, usually I get obsessed with something for a year and then right. I'm over it. And maybe because he keeps changing, they keep changing. Like, she keeps remaking herself, her new record, Take It Like a Man, which is not my favorite of her records. But, mm-hmm. like, she just keeps pushing and evolving and, and both of them. Like, they're just, each record is new and different. And uh, I don't know. I admire that. And as an artist, it makes me want, I don't know, makes me want to not make the same thing twice, you know? Mm -hmm. If, if you were going to, well, not if you were going to this on this podcast, you're introducing people to them. Mm -hmm. How would you, what's your prescription for either like what album should people start with? Or is there like a YouTube yeah. How how should people s- start? You know what? They have a tiny dust concert. Yeah. They have a oh, tiny dust concert okay. that they both play on. That's it's like because so he's Jason Isbell on the four hundred unit, mm-hmm. um, and but then she often plays in the four hundred unit. Not okay. always, but a lot. Um, so there's just a wonderful if you want to in a, like a capsule moment of them. They do mm-hmm. this tiny dust concert, and there's this just particularly beautiful moment in it. <laughs> and you know they're bantering and goofing around with the band and stuff. But there are a couple of things that happen in this concert. One is he looks out into the audience and is like, my husband swears up and down that this was planted, but I, I have to believe that it wasn't. Mm-hmm. He looks out into the audience and he's like, does anybody know how to play the guitar really good? Like really good? Mm-hmm. And this kid who I guess works at NPR or whatever, it raises his hand. And, and so Jason calls him up and he's like, all my life when I was a young man. I wished that somebody would do this for me. Would like mm-hmm. look out into an audience and say, who can play the guitar? And he's like, yeah. so come on up here. And so this kid like jumps up with the band and plays along for a song. And it's just a really uh, sweet, generous moment. I love that. But the other moment in this, in this video that's really spectacular is they goof up. Like he messes mm-hmm. up something. And then she, he messes up something like a lyric and they stop. And like they're, like they're gonna like keep on going, and then he's like, "No, wait, can we start over?" Like that goofed me up. Mm-hmm. And then Amanda's like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm glad we're starting over because I didn't do my best either." And there's uh, just this really beautiful marriage moment of like, yeah. of like being vulnerable along with somebody so that their vulnerability isn't so vulnerable. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's just a really anyway. So that's a really nice place to start. Is there's a couple of songs. I think it's like four tracks. Um, but he's never like they're never not good. So any mm-hmm. live show, any any, there not every song will be your favorite song, but, sure. but every live show is a wonderful performance. He's really a musician and a sort of performer. Yeah, 
is he t- I'm going to look and see if they're touring. They are touring and they're not coming here. What? Well, no, because again, he's doing this whole thing where he's doing smaller venues in in, in not big cities right now. Because mm. he feels like he always goes to Atlanta, so instead he's going to Macon or whatever. Okay. So you have to travel a little further to see him. And the other thing I'll say is politically, they're very left. They're mm-hmm. very, very progressive. And she's been very actively involved with uh, pro-choice politics and mm. reproductive rights politics. And um, they did a record together a couple of years ago called The Problem about abortion, which I'm sorry, putting like you live in Nashville and perform as a country right. star to put out a song that's so overtly pro-choice. And to be so loudly pro-choice is pretty amazing. And right now they're involved in organizing. I don't remember the name of it, but right now they're involved in organizing um, a benefit concert for trans rights in Nashville, like with other country musicians. So. Yeah, that is. I, it, I'm that's the the <laughs> the you know like where are my words? It's good to know that some of the musicians are starting to speak out. Yeah. And he's he walks a really interesting line because he really engages with his fan base. So mm-hmm. if you follow him on Twitter, like he'll he'll write back. And like once I accidentally tagged him into a long thread that got viral, and then so then he was getting spammed with it. Oh no! And I it's the only time I've ever done it. But I messaged him was like, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do that too. And he was like, It's cool. Like he's just mm-hmm. he's a very human person online. Um, But when somebody comes for him politically, when somebody does the like, shut up and play, you Mm -hmm. know, we don't want to hear your politics. He he dishes it back. Like he's very clear that like this is there's this one song. If you want a song that that sort of captures the politics of it, um, he has a song, uh, Hope the High Road. Mm -hmm. um, That's just really like an anthemic, big sort of Bruce Springsteen style Mm -hmm. kind of rock song about. And like the chorus is like, there can't be more of them than us. Right. Um, that that he's chosen his moment in history and his argument, and he's sort of open to growth and stuff like that. But but there, it's he's not he's not here to make friends with people who who he really sees as being problematic. Um, and yeah. it's just it's in in the country music it's in particular it's just mm-hmm. a very you don't get credit <laughs> right for 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 that so yeah so there's always been a tradition of it you know if you look at Loretta Lynn or Mm -hmm. now have you do you think he knows has he connected who you are online with who you are offline like have you ever had an in-person moment where you're like okay now he knows like this Twitter person is also this person in the like up against the bar in the front row I no, I've never met him in person. Okay. Um, I mean, I've I have been in the front row, sort of staring right. at him. But I I've I I I don't think like if he and we know people who like because I live in Atlanta and he mm-hmm. has you know been in Athens a lot over the years or whatever. Like we have friends in common, mm-hmm. or you know, like I have a friend whose ex boyfriend was a buddy of his kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it is that thing of like, and I, you know, I've been in and around the band scene on one level or another since I was a teenager. Yeah. Um, so we've probably been in a party somewhere together at mm-hmm. some point. Um, but uh, I don't, I like being a fan, mm-hmm. you know, like I, at one point, like I would love, like they have a daughter who, um, who is online and there's like a part of me that wants to like send a box of books and be like, you've given so much to my family. Like mm-hmm. you really, they've created the soundtrack of our pandemic, the soundtrack of my kids adolescent years, yeah. like my bedtime songs. Like they've contributed so much to my household that there's a part of me that's like, I want to give you, I want to give mercy my books. Like I want to, I want to give you something, you know? Right. But it's not in the sense of like, I want to be friends with you. It's in right. the sense of like an artistic exchange or something mm-hmm. like a, a show of appreciation I think I would never be able to be my normal self if I were around them. Yeah. And that I, I'm more than anything in the world. I'm not like as evidenced by this podcast, like I'm not good at a carefully sculpted, like I'm not good at a pretend persona. Uh-huh. So I think that it would make me super anxious actually. Um, if I were to ever to encounter them in human form. Yeah. But I would like them to know just how much they've meant to me. Yeah.
Do I sound like a total cheese ball? <laughs> you don't. Not at all. That's, I mean, look, the point of this podcast was it's so much of what we, you know, you, before we hit record, you talked about like having to change your podcast diet a little bit to get away from constant news, right? Yes. I think we are finally, even as Gen X, growing out of liking things ironically, yep. being cynical about everything. And part of this podcast was it feels good to hear people talk about what they love. Mm-hmm. And it feels good as a host to give people space to talk about something they love. Right. And not not with like cynic detachment yeah. and not um, not like with fear of being judged. Like, I think if, you know, if the pandemic taught us anything or like heightened anything, one of the things is is to embrace what you love, but also let the creator of it know, like if there's a way to bring more people on board with something you love or, or share, you know, make sure the person making the thing knows you love it, saying thank you, showing a little bit more gratitude. Um, I think for me, it's, it's all about, it's just more fun. Yeah. To talk about something that you dig. Versus... You just said something that is like I'm going to be thinking about all day because I think I knew it, but I hadn't articulated it. You're mm-hmm. right. The pandemic, a big thing, one of the few really beautiful things that came out of the pandemic is that when you removed the world, like like if I'm going to dinner with a friend, I begin by compromising. I know she's a vegetarian. Right. Yeah, like, you know, like that sort of, but when you're only doing takeout for yourself. Right. Then you're like, no, I want to eat tacos four meals in a row for breakfast too, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. but like you really, and in a world where everything felt triggered, everything felt traumatic, you leaned into the joys you could find. So if, so my kids and I started taking midnight walks oh. because, like, in a world without a schedule, and like, who cares? You know, like, right? And so we would take also. These, it's so hot in Atlanta. Midnight is a lovely time to walk. And we were super, super locked down because my mm-hmm. mom was really sick. So when we were taking walks during the afternoon, we would take like a like a lacrosse stick to keep six feet away from anybody, even outside. Like we were terrified in the beginning. Yeah. Um, so midnight walks were also just lonely. Like there was no one yeah. there. You didn't have to worry about bumping into people. Um, but so I think you're right. Like I, I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're right. Like I discovered that I really love poached eggs and I discovered that it's worth it to make espresso in the house. And I discovered yeah. that I like gin and tonics at five o'clock or, you know, mm-hmm. whatever it is that I hadn't made time for those things. And when the world went away and time restrictions went away and other people went away, then you really, all you had was yourself to help you decide what to do with yourself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And now since, you know, since we have gotten access to vaccines, the pandemic isn't over, but we have more risk mitigation tools available to us. Correct. I'll say that. Two months after I was fully vaccinated, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Yeah. And now I'm a year out from radiation. And so I also have a, like, suck the marrow from the bone, go to the thing. Um, And sometimes I'm a little embarrassed how much I travel to see podcasts. Like, I'm like, oh, it's embarrassing. And I'm like, but it's not. It's I I love the the people who are fans. Like, I'm involved in the online fandoms of a couple podcasts and I'm going to LA in, in a week and a half to see how did this get made at Largo like That's it's awesome. just fun it's just fun to embrace the things that give us joy yeah what is it about Gen X why did I think when you just said that before like I found myself thinking about at some point recently I tried to explain to my older kid who's 17 and a half mm-hmm. what the word poser means you know what I mean and mm-hmm. uh, like like he had said something that made me think about it. And I was like, oh, well, when we were kids, we called that a poser. And, and he was like, well, what does that mean? And I was like, well, like, it's like somebody who's like sort of doing, like sort of pretending to like the thing you like, but they don't know it as well as you do. And they like haven't fully committed to it. Like, and I just found myself thinking, what an absurd idea. <laughs> like, right. That like, like you don't well, get they, to, like. They like, shop at Hot Topic, but they don't have a skateboard. Right. Or, <laughs> or, right. Were they like, like when I was like, I, I 
follow the dead a bit when I was mm-hmm. in high school, like that, like the girls who wear a wraparound skirt once in a while, but they shave their legs, like, right. That, like they haven't committed. They're not fully invested in this lifestyle mm-hmm. we were participating in. And now as an adult, I look at that and I'm like, that's just crazy. Like, right. like everybody should enjoy whatever they like, however they like it. And if they want to change their mind the next day, they should change their mind the next day. Mm-hmm. I don't know how we got like that. Yeah. It's it. The other word that doesn't really have meaning anymore is sellout. Mm hmm. Right. Well, we all sold out. I mean, like, we all sold out. <laughs> we now understand hypercapitalism, right? We're right. all participating in a system. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. But like yeah. posers and sellouts, what were huge, you know, hurtful things you could say to somebody that wasn't like racist. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Right. No, but posers right. and sellouts. Like the first time, uh, the, right. Like, was it a, I'm trying to, there was either a Rolling Stones song or a Beatles song that was used in one car commercial. And it yeah, was yeah. like this moment. Like now I we're think, done with the Stones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, hopefully we're a little wiser on the other side of all this mm-hmm. and allow ourselves the joy that we find. I, yeah. Which doesn't mean that you get everything and that doesn't mean that you right. sacrifice everything for the things you want. But, uh. Yeah. And maybe that's like, I don't know, to bring it full circle, like maybe that's the thing about Jason Isbell and Amanda Shires is like, it felt like there was this thing that I got great pleasure out of that actually made me a smarter, better, more thoughtful version of myself, Mm -hmm. made me engage with ideas that were new to me Mm -hmm. um, and sort of changed the context of some of my relationships, just like watching them be a couple, be interacting with each other in the world. Um. Which just felt like a really great gift. Like, Yeah. Do they... So they do their live shows together, and she is sometimes in his band. Is he ever in her band, or yes. do they release recordings together? Yeah. So they the, the problem they did together, though it's like her song... I think it's a question of who writes. So like mm. his songs are his songs, her songs are her songs. Okay. He doesn't, I think, play in her live band very often. Like, I think she tours as Amanda Shire's. I mm-hmm. think mostly he doesn't. I haven't seen him play on her stage, mm-hmm. but I have seen her. But she's like, I mean, that she's really, he's really a front man and she's really a front woman, but also she's a fiddle player who spent years and years as a side man. So I think it's okay. easier for her to play fiddle on his stuff than it is for him to like sing on hers or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so, and I might be wrong about that, but, um, but, uh, but they record together. Like they, like they lay tracks on, I think I, I don't think either one of them has any records that the other one doesn't play on since they've been a couple. Okay. And, um, and like, like if they do, like she just did Jimmy Kimmel. I think it was Jimmy mm-hmm. Kimmel. Um, she just did some big television show and like, he's on the stage playing, but, but v- like very much in the background. Like, mm-hmm. and that's, they and they've done some interviews about that. They, they talk about that. And I really appreciate that too. Like that she talks about like <laughs> parenting as a superstar couple where one of them's a woman and one of them's mm-hmm. not and like the roles and you know that he got famous and she was still playing in a van and he had a tour bus and that right. like what that does for a dynamic in a relationship and how you carve out space and time for your work when it's valued less financially than your partners right which i think we all many of us mm-hmm. <laughs> have navigated that that yeah. those waters so again like it's just a lot of what they're dealing with and my my husband's a musician and I'm a writer and like it's mm-hmm. we're not them but like it's the same kind of dynamic of like how do you make space for you know my my writing has become my job and my husband still has a day job how do we make sure that we prioritize and make space for his music even mm-hmm. if it's not gonna go on the taxes at the end of the year you know right um so hmm. yeah they're really special yeah it's it's a it's a wonderful story. I'm I'm sure that I I'm gonna listen to some of their music before I publish this. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure I'm sure because I know his name, so I'm I'm certain that when I listen, I'll be like, oh right, duh, I know this music. You know this guy, yeah. Mm-hmm. The I mean, they both at this point has she won? Yes, because oh, well, she's also she's a, then she a couple years ago started this like super group with Brandy Carlisle and Maren Morris and mm. Natalie Hemby called The High Women. And they won a Grammy two years ago for a song called um, Crowded Table. So like that, like 
They were out. They were doing a lot of stuff. And Brandy Carlisle okay. has been kind of a big deal lately, I think. Yeah. And, um. So so they were sort of getting like they played Newport. Mm-hmm. They did a song with Dolly at Newport that I think went kind mm. of viral. And so you've probably seen her play with the High Women. Um, but uh, he's got real range. That's the other thing is yeah. I'd say like if you if you listen to Hope the High Road, which is like a big anthemic political song that'll like like I listen to it with the windows down in the car when I'm angry, yeah. you know. And then you listen to Elephant, which is about cancer and trigger warning, like might okay. be a lot. Um, which is, but it's a very quiet, very personal, very like real life moment of mm-hmm. having loving somebody with cancer. Um, and then you listen to Codeine, which is just like a fun bar song, kind of like people in a bar, kind of. I mean, it's not because all of its songs are sad, but like it's a it's a rambunctious sad song. Mm-hmm. Um, but the song I probably come back to if I wanted to like. Uh, is something more than free. Okay. It's just a, I don't know, it captures, I think, something of like, like sort of underlines a lot of the other songs. Yeah. Nice. I could well, write a I paper, will... I guess. Yeah, you could. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to write a PhD thesis about. about... There's at least, there's at least, uh, there are uh, a few essays in there. Yeah. So but I don't want to write those essays. I just want to listen to his music. Mm-hmm. And probably at some point write a book that, speaks to it in some way i tend yeah. to do that like i have one of my novels bigger than a bread box is all like woven around the bruce springsteen song hungry heart mm-hmm. and uh my last book my jasper june begins with a, a gloss from uh leonard cohen song like there's just a like, yeah a, rock music finds its way into my children's writing which is yeah. kind of weird but is there a a soundtrack for the for the newest book um the witch of woodland i mean in some ways it's well, the joke is I was writing the acknowledgments for it just recently, sort of putting the last touches on it. And I ended up adding this line about Stacey Abrams. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I feel like the, the soundtrack to everything in our lives the last five years, if you live in Georgia, is political. Yeah. Um, so in some ways, I feel like this book is infused. It's not a political book. Like, that's not what it's about at all. But I feel like the spirit within which I wrote it came out of this moment where we have been locking, knocking doors and marching mm-hmm. for so long. Um but yeah, I mean, the music that sort of played in the background of it is a collection of Americana artists, Jason Isbell, Amanda Shires, uh, Waxahachie. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and something I, I definitely have been noticing in my work lately is, or not in my work, but in my listening lately is more and more the people I listen to are all sober. And I don't know mm. what, what, I don't know if that's something about the way that sobriety affects the music and recovery and sort of the fact that they sing and think about it. Or if I actually am leaning that direction, which my lifestyle would not indicate that. Mm-hmm. But um, but if there's something in me that's sort of looking for a change, I don't know. But but so it's funny. I was just realizing this the other day that like my whole playlist lately is sober is artists. Sober artists. I mean, part of it is that sobriety does bring with it some longevity. Mm-hmm. Right. But I also think there's like, it's sort of what I was saying at the beginning about Half-Life, about that book mm-hmm. of essays. There's, if your identity is sitting on a fence, mm-hmm. nothing is an easy, comfortable solution. So you have to examine and think about mm-hmm. yourself. And I think that maybe sobriety is the same. I mean, again, I'm not speaking from experience, so this is obnoxious of me to say, but like, that I wonder if sobriety isn't like the same kind of thing in that you have been forced to examine your life, make choices and changes. Mm-hmm. And that has to be introspective on some level. That yeah. has, you have to, nothing, you can't just go to the party. You have to think before you go to the party. You can't right. just, you know, walk into the restaurant. You have to think about whether you, sort of this moment, this experience, what, are, what am I going to have instead of a drink when they offer me a drink? You know, that there's mm-hmm. a kind of self-awareness that, um, that just makes things really thoughtful, yeah. mindful. Um, right, that it's a daily, if not hourly choice. Yeah, and critical. So, like, mm-hmm both of the self sometimes and of the world around you right not judgment not that Mm -hmm. but there's and and gratitude like there's all these things mixed in of gratitude Mm -hmm. and introspection and critical thinking that are sort of all there that is very different than like let's raise a beer right Right. there's so many let's raise a beer songs that the song that says i'm not going to raise this beer but mm-hmm. why? Or I'm going to raise this beer, but then set it back down again. Or I'm right. going to raise this beer and regret it later. Right. Um, there's just, it's like, you know, they say constraints drive innovation. And like that there's something in that of like the constraint of sobriety 
causes one to think about the world more creatively. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Maybe. This is I'm just. It's a question I have. Yeah. Hmm. It's a good question. Thank you. But it is. It's a. It's an act of choice, and I think for musicians on the road to be able to maintain totally a bubble when you're faced possibly with isolation with like just the exhaustion of the road and not turn to that as um well and at the end of a long day a drink feels like a reset Mm -hmm. and it can be really hard when I every now and then I'll take a month or a week and not drink Mm -hmm. just just to make sure that I can right and it's it's like I have to replace it with some other ritual right Mm -hmm. I can't because it's it's not just lifting the alcohol out it's like it it operates as like a marker in the day and I don't know it makes me think about the other thing I thought about picking for my favorite thing when you asked um, was this one particular podcast episode that is Ezra Klein interviewing Jeff Tweedy Mm -hmm. have you listened to this I Um, haven't but Jeff and I go to the same synagogue oh well you can tell him that I've listened to it probably 10 times at this point it is the best the best anything I've heard on craft in a really, mm-hmm. maybe since I read the triggering town, like it, yeah. it, it, um, but he talks about, uh, art as the best way of disappearing mm. and about mental health issues and, uh, addiction as other, you know, and video games and television and, the, the, and maybe I'm extrapolating, but like putting it in my own life, it was like, what are the things I do to disappear Mm-hmm. from the world and it's true that like when you get into a groove and you put in six hours working on a novel or a poem you're not in your life anymore you're in mm-hmm. this other state um and I think there's something there too like in the sobriety and art conversation and then the like disappearing art conversation they're mm-hmm. just yeah these things are all sort of coming together for me right now but it is I, I'll give a plug for this since I didn't talk about okay. it it is I tell all my students all my creative writing students I make them listen to this podcast I all feel right like it is all about getting the spirit of play and sort of uh, the lack of judgment and sort of expectation out of the way of your work so that you can just enjoy it in a playful mindset. Yeah, because Jeff did two books and like kind of right in a row. He did his, he did a, wrote a memoir. Right. And then he had a book on how to write one song, how to write yeah. one song. Yeah. Yeah. And it, so I think he was on tour for that when he did this interview or something. Okay. Because um, he comes back to it, and some of the craft exercises are really good. But the, in some ways, like the book's great, but the there was just something about the two of the. I mean, Ezra Klein's such a good interviewer. Like mm-hmm. the two of them speaking to each other was just it hit me the right day, um, and has been really impactful for me. Yeah. Outstanding. Well, Laurel, this has been wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's nice yeah. to nice to catch. It's so up. good to finally talk. I know. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Finding Favorites with Leah Jones. Please make sure to subscribe and drop us a five-star review on iTunes. Now, go out and enjoy your favorite things.